Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Unusually beautiful day for January. Yeah. We'll accept it while it lasts because, you know, it's January, February in Iowa, so don't expect it to last too long. Um, some housekeeping for today. Um, this little key gets you to what I have affectionately deemed the outhouse. <laughs> They're currently remodeling our bathroom, so we actually have to go out and back in to use the restroom. It's So if you go out and across, there's a, it says 131 across the top, so it's what, Kim's Animal House. Animal, Animal House, House, and then there's a, the hair affair, I think is what it says right below that. Put the key in. Light switch is on the right hand side. The middle one turns on the hallway light. All the way in the hallway, hang a right, go through the doors. Women's first door on the right, men's second door on the right. So if you need this, it will be back on the table there with the red. I'm going to toss this to Mark. The red tablecloth on the table back there. Same table that has the sign that says, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're rejoicing because we do still have a bathroom to use. <laughs> so, second piece of housekeeping is the communion cups. If you have not got one, raise your hand. Pastor Mark will get you one. I've got an extra one here, so. Well, maybe. Nope, put it up here. Um, CDC has updated their guidelines, and so uh, we want to be able to continue to do communion. We also want to be able to have Mark travel around the country doing his acquisitions for his, the company he works for without getting into trouble or getting sick or anything. So uh, we'll just go ahead and do that. That's an easy fix. So next up, uh, coming in, what, two weeks? is our next men's breakfast be right here in the sink well it won't be a sanctuary that morning it'll be a dining room area and we will be having uh, a great time of food which is always good there's rumor that we might have something different than what we have been having maybe because of a griddle maybe have some batter you know you flip them put syrup and butter on them i put a little teaser there you go no. Just well, the you always have the biscuits. <laughs> I, have to, I have to do that or else Benny would have kicked me out. So. Yeah, yeah. We, we talked about not doing biscuits and gravy, but we didn't want Benny to revolt so or my dad. So uh, they'll still have biscuits and gravy. Um, Nine o'clock on February 4th, uh, right here. Uh, then following that, the next weekend, it's a busy week for us. We have season 18 starting. I uh, ran in, I just, people that have run into that have, done racing in the past and don't realize it's still going on or just can't believe it's season 18. Um, I saw a picture of, uh, his name is Scott, He's, he started coming, he was about this tall. I saw a picture of his son, he's like <laughs> two, like how did, how did that happen? So we have been doing it just a short time, um, lots of fun, yeah, looks like it won't be much change in the rules uh, based on the rules committee's uh, responses so we're looking forward to getting that rolling and going and then in April and this is not a joke because it's April 1st but in Davenport uh, we will be attending Iron Sharpens Iron the 2023 men's conference um, this is an equip it's not it's not like a mountaintop experience like what Promise Keepers tends to give. This is an equipping set, uh, conference. It's a one-day conference that equips men and young men starting at 13 and older. So uh, there'll be one in the morning and one in the afternoon where we'll have keynote speakers. As you can see on the screen, those keynote speakers are Stephen Kendrick. Uh, Stephen has been serving in church ministry for over 20 years and... Uh, since leaving full-time ministry, he now writes, speaks, and produces Christian films with his brothers Alex and Shannon and Stephen. And uh, so Stephen has been producing and co-writing movies like that we've actually watched here, like Overcomer, War Room, Courageous. Um, we haven't seen Fireproof here yet. That I'll think about that. And also Facing the Giants. Um, 
they released two films in 2021, which was new for them. Uh, that was Courageous Legacy and then Show Me the Father. And that was a full length documentary. So we're looking forward to hearing from him. And then there's Joe Martin. Dr. Joe Martin is an award-winning international speaker, author, educator, and certified builder of men. He's offered, authored or co-authored nine books and has spoken not just in churches or ministry organizations, but businesses over 750 in total. And so uh, looking forward to uh, hearing him. He is the host of Real Men Connect which is the number one rated podcast for Christian men on Apple Music. So, looking forward to that. It's 8.30 a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m. Um, and that reminds me, we have a sign-out sheet. So, we'll start it on this side and let it work its way onto the other side to sign up. So, we don't have an exact cost at the moment because there is potential for two costs. If we can get 10 or more men signed up to go with us, we get a reduced rate. And we don't want to take your money now if we get a reduced rate. So uh, we'll be getting that. So early registration uh, with the group would be $49. Uh, if we don't get the, the 10 or more, then it will be 59. And certainly if it's after uh, early registration ends in March, then it is $69. Students, however, are 33, so it's cheaper for students. So I know we have at least one student in here who might be going, so. There you go, saving me money. See? I'm working on, I'm, you're retired now, so you know, I've got to try and save you money. So that is up there. Um, and the music is wonderful. It is, they have a, a band that is uh, incredible. I've got one of their worship CDs and they, they just do a wonderful job to bring us into worship. Um, for those of you that are watching online, look for the link that we'll be putting in the, uh, the feed of the live with the playlist for today's worship music. The last bit of announcements that I have, and I forgot to make a slide. <laughs> happy fifth anniversary or happy fifth birthday, depending on how you want to look at it, to Grace Street Church. We planted and started having services five years ago. If I remember right, the date was five years ago, yesterday, mm -hmm. the 14th. So um, it's hard to believe that five years has flown. It just has absolutely flown by. We are in our what, fourth space. Our <laughs> <laughs> but this is this is this is more of a permanent space for us. We have a three-year lease here, yeah. and would love to see that expand <laughs> unless we outgrow it. But if we outgrow it, we could always do two services and just, <laughs> we're just wear the pastors out a little bit. That's all right. I'd rather wear the pastors out yeah. and have a bunch of people on and uh, looking forward to seeing what God has for us as a ministry. So with that, let's, as I say every, every week, let's switch gears. Let's slow down a moment and let's get ready to hear the word of God this morning. Now, this Bible is kind of special to me. My granddaughter, Kelly, who's probably going to hide now because I said that, asked me to put the tabs in it. And so I did that last night for her. And it just so happens that the Bible that she uses for school and Sunday school is the exact same version as what Pastor Mark has chosen for us this morning from Isaiah 40, 28. And in this version, it says it this way, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Now these first two questions in this verse, have you not known, have you not heard, echo just a few verses before. Verse 21 where it says, haven't you heard, don't you understand but i like what it continues to say in verse 21 it says are you deaf to the words of god it's like hello the words he gave before the world began are and the ver this is the way the version puts it so I'm, don't call me out on this but are you so ignorant now 
here's the thing. We, if we are students of the Bible, which my granddaughter Kelly made <clears throat> me feel bad yesterday because she rattled off all the books of the Bible, not just getting them all, but in order. Awesome. Wow. Good which, <laughs> as I told Mark this morning and I told her and her mom yesterday, I can't even do that. <laughs> so I was, I was really proud of her and she's learning two verses a week. And, and so she's understanding that creation, and this is something we all need to understand, creation reveals God's power and his wisdom from the beginning to what will become not just now, but into the future. Now, we mentioned it last week, and, and I, I actually snuck a peek at the slides in the sermon, and I know, I know Mark's going to talk about a football player this week, but, and I didn't see this in there, there's another football player out there who is in ICU right now because he went into the waters to save his children, and he saved them from drowning. He understands what God is doing in his life. And he needs our prayer just as much. But I, 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 as we think about things, as we go through things, prayer is such a vital part of all of this. And, and as God reveals that power and wisdom to us, think about this future that we have. What a future it is. And I, and don't be putting this in the context of that squirt, that box we like to put everything into. Think of this as outside of that box as, as eternity with Jesus in heaven. The future that we have, it's a one with a world, because it does say Jesus is going to come back and reign for a thousand years. It's a world of righteousness, a world of justice, and a world of peace, and, and it's a world of no pain. So for all of you that are experiencing pain, wherever that pain may be, uh, however that pain may be, or disease, that's all. See, we have to remember that God is not limited to the same things that we are. It is a life that we can't even imagine at this point. But it's also a life, and I'm going to steal Mark's sermon title right here. Because, and I'm going to do it just a little bit differently. Because in real life, God's not dead. Father God, we come before you this morning knowing that you are not dead, that you are alive, that you are all-powerful, that you are all-knowing, that your power and wisdom came from, was before the beginning and will be into eternity, beyond everything that we can imagine, Father. We know you give us a future. Jeremiah 29 11 tells us we have a future of a hope with a hope. It will be a world of righteousness, justice, peace, of healed bodies and healed minds. Father, we look forward to the day that you return, that this world becomes fully yours and that the evil one, that Satan is banished completely and forever into the lake of fire and that we will never have to deal with him again. But until then, Father, give us the strength, give us the wisdom, give us the power that we need to get through the rest of this life here on earth. In Jesus' name, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, good morning, church. Good morning. good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. How can you not? I mean, just... I was just standing over there while Terry was up here doing the call to worship. I was looking out, and I was looking at the beautiful sky and the sunshine and everything, and I was just going, wow. You have to understand the awesomeness of the God that we serve. It really is. It's awesome. And the sunsets that we've had lately, I don't know if you guys have been watching, but the beautiful colors out there. What an artist. I wish I could do stuff like that. So in our call to worship today, I, I kind of wanted to follow up with our movie that we showed. We showed the God's Not Dead 4, We the People. Um, it was a Saturday 4 yesterday. Yeah, it was a week, wasn't it? Yeah. But, you know, what I, what I want to have everybody understand is 
Uh, we heard several things in that movie, and we, we hear it in real day, in real life today out here that God is dead and that he's irrelevant and that he's useless. And, you know, when, when we think about this, it's the same kind of thing that they were talking about back in the days of Isaiah. Isaiah 40, 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God? Meaning, God was then, was there then. He's here today, he's going to be here tomorrow. Long after we're gone, God still remains. And I wanted to make sure that we understood that. He created the ends of the earth. He created everything. And he doesn't grow faint. He doesn't grow weary. When we give him our burdens, we don't have to worry about overburdening him. And he won't be able to take care of us. Because he does not grow faint. He doesn't grow weary. And his understanding of everything is unsearchable because it's everlasting. He's omnipotent. He's everywhere and he's in everything. And we need to understand that. That's the God that we serve. Now that verse goes on to say that he gives power to the faint. And to him that has no might, he increases strength. So even at, at your weakest point, even when you're down as far as you can go, God still will give you strength. God still will lift you up. He will edify you in his spirit. No matter what we're facing, God is bigger than anything that we come against or will come against us. We need to understand that. So this passage in Isaiah was written 600 years before the birth of Christ, and yet it's still alive today. It's still true today. We can rely on it. We can stand on his word. That means we can rely on the word of God to be true and active and faithful in our life and it is relevant and it is unchanging god is not dead in real life he is here today so a lot of times we hear things you know we're trying to figure out you know is it just kind of something that's being said out there or is it for real and so that term in real life comes into play well, for the last hundred years, the learned and the elitist out there, mostly in academia, uh, have been telling us and advancing the agenda that God is dead. And that 2,000 year old stories, or you might refer to, find them referred to now lately as myths in the Bible. If you go and do a search in Google or in Wikipedia, it comes up and says, this myth that is in the Bible. Well. It's not just a story, it's not just a myth, because we're proving it out as history. And you might find that these things kind of rub you wrong when you hear it. But what they're telling people is these myths are irrelevant and they're unwanted in today's society. Nobody wants to hear those stories. Nobody wants to have to believe those stories. And the mantra of a whole woke society that it's all inclusive, that it's tolerant, we're supposed to embrace diversity in all of its realms, but in reality, their mantra is not really like that. Their, their beliefs are not really like that. And anyone that doesn't possess that same mindset as they do, well, then they're reviled in society. They're cast out against them. See, they feel everyone must be compliant to their agenda and to their beliefs, and if you don't, then they're going to come along and I'll use today's terminology, they want to cancel you. So if you don't believe the same things that they do and you're, you're not speaking and going along with their agenda, then you need to be canceled. You don't belong in society anymore today. And we as Christians, that's what we're facing on a daily basis. People are trying to cancel us because we're irrelevant, because we believe in these myths from 2,000 years ago. So I've got to ask you something today. Does this seem tolerant or diverse in mindset? No. Not at all. It's very exclusive by its very nature and you can't have it both ways at the same time, folks. Mm -hmm. You can't tell everybody that you're tolerant. You can't tell everybody that you're diverse in your mindset 
if you immediately turn around and exclude a whole set of people that are greater than the set of people who are making up the rules. And that's what we face in society today. And it seems like freedom of speech and freedom of expression don't hold any weight. They no longer hold any weight. And I feel, you know, Pastor Terry talked about where these people might end up, uh, according to the scriptures. I feel these guys really like heat. That's the only thing, you know, I can figure out about this whole thing is they really like heat. You figure it out from there. <laughs> so part of the agenda that I find most ex uh, interesting is that they shun God in the process of this. In their mantra, in their mindset, in their agendas, they shun God. And anyone that would believe in God is just a fool with foolish thoughts. And they <clears throat> pollute society as a whole today. They stand in the way of their truth. But when there's an issue, or a tragedy, or a disaster that affects them in some way, then they ask everybody to pray to God and ask him to intervene. Kind of seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? Counterindictive. They're saying one thing, but asking you to do something completely against what they just got done saying is irrelevant. Doesn't make a lot of sense. But they want God to come in and they want him to save the day. See, and then in those rare instances, God becomes relevant, more or less a necessary evil. And therefore, in that set of circumstances, then God is allowed. Okay? It makes no sense. I like to use this as people want to turn around and just simply use God as a crutch. You know, you, you get stuck in a place and you can't take care of it on your own. So therefore, let's, let's now go to God. Let's not in, involve him from the very beginning. But let's go to God once we have an issue. Once we have a problem, we're going to use God as a crutch. Hey, God, if you can get me out of this one, if you can take care of this problem that we have, if you can oversee this disaster and bring us through it, then you're going to be relevant. You're going to be needed. You're going to be alive. See, and it's at these times when those who have sought to make God irrelevant or dead seemingly admit that, number one, there is a God, he is alive, and he is relevant. I think that's a really important point. In times of trouble, then they kind of fall back on what they know or used to know, but have chosen to push aside. And now God is relevant. He's no longer dead. They admit that the, there is a God and that he can take care of this situation. So I've got to ask you, what happened to our society? What happened to our world? See, for literally thousands of years, we were a God-fearing world, a God-fearing society. Now, that doesn't mean that we were, you know, afraid of God. So as kind of an aside, what does it mean if you're God-fearing? It means fearing God means bowing in utter reverence and respect for the one who created the world. Fear is rooted in both awe and terror at the same time. So when they, when they use this term, it's kind of changed its meaning over the years. And we've got away from that reverence, respect of the word fear. And we've just gone into the terror portion of it. But see, that's not what it's about. We need to be in awe of God. God, the almighty ruler of the universe. He is indeed all powerful. And so therefore, we should treat him with reverence and awe. We should be afraid of fear of his power because he is all powerful. But see, it's the reverence and the awe part that seem to get pushed aside. So where did we go astray? Well, in short, there's this term that came about called utopian idealism. And utopian idealism basically is based in greed, lust for power. And when you think about those things, it says we're going to have a utopian society where everybody gets along and everybody uh, is working together in harmony with one another. 
It's called a utopia. It's an it's a imaginary world. If everything could go right, here we are. So this utopian idealism is what kind of took over and kind of replaced where God is in society. So from being a God-fearing, loving society into this utopian idealism in here, which is based in greed. They want more stuff. They want more power. They don't want anybody standing in their way. And so Satan really has got a foothold and is pushing hard to make himself number one through those people and through those agendas. And he's doing it through the fringe elements in society that learned if they scream loud enough and protest loud enough and long enough out here, people will kick into the demands just to make sure they just go away, that they just shut up, okay? And the problem with this is then they tend to target anyone who would get in the way of what they want, their agendas that they want, <coughs> this power grab, and it puts a big bullseye on God and on Christianity as a whole. And yes, there's other religions out there, but somehow these groups can align themselves with their thoughts because they see them as less than a threat than the Judeo-Christians who tend to be very fervent in their belief system and their resolve and they're very influential in society or had been. See, if we take a look at that over history, the Judeo-Christians were the bedrock and the founding of this country, of our laws, of our whole system of governance for this country. And as a direct result of those beliefs and the resolves of those fathers, we built this country upon those beliefs. And it's evident through every one of our uh, pieces of legislation, our constitution, our bill of rights, our money, in God we trust, e pluribus unum, our freedoms for all. And we get those freedoms from God and they knew that in God we trust, meaning God is truth. We can trust in his word. We can stand firmly on his word. But see, that gets in the way of these other agendas. Those things get in the way. God gets in the way. We get in the way of those agendas. So what happens? Well, it starts by making God a non-issue then. How do we get rid of God? Well, first off, we've got to make sure that he's a non-issue. That's moldy old stories from 2,000 years ago. They don't even make sense in today's society. We know better. Science has proved all this stuff. <clears throat> eh, not really, though. Science is proving it correct instead. So how do we go about removing God from society? We've got to make him irrelevant to start with. Make him a non-issue. Making followers of God marginalized and shown to be chasing after foolish, outdated thinking. And it starts with chipping away at anything related to God. It's not a, a big movement all at once. It's just chip away at this, and chip away at this, and chip away at this. So what have we seen happen? Well, we had to remove God from the workplace. God has no prop place in the workplace. Can't have that. Well, God in schools and prayer in schools. Oh, that had to go away. Can't have that. We can't have God in there. And then... We've got to have your voices heard louder and stronger than what your opponents are. Attack them on every front. Attack their character. Attack their families. Revise history to reflect your narrative. If you look at the books that we have in school today, you'll notice that a lot of our history has been rewritten. And it's been rewritten because there's inconvenient truths in those history books. It's what actually happened but they need to revise that history in order to advance that agenda. In order to advance that God is dead, we have to revise history to show that God is irrelevant. It's kind of frightening if you think about it. And I'm far from done. But does any of this sound familiar? Have we seen any of this in our lifetime? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's happening every day. It's scary. It's frightening. No wonder we live in a lost world. The Word of God tells us these things will happen. People turn against God and turn inward to find realism, 
self-realization, self-reliance. But see, all of these things are temporal, meaning they're just a means to an end, and soon these things will lead to moral decay, disappointment, factionalism, chaos, a downward spiral re revolting in our society today. And the results is our society as a whole suffers. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, Lovers, oh, lovers of pleasures rather than of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, and avoid such men as these. Now think about when this was written. It could have been written yesterday. It could have been written today. But this is not new. This was written 2,000 years ago. And it's still relevant today. It's still happening in our society today. And this passage stands as a warning against utopian idealism that believes that human society, through its own actions, absent of God, will continue to improve itself. And materially, yes, we will progress materially through material things. Absent of God. But see, we're still going to be driven by destructive self-motivation, self-governance, and in many ways will decline morally and spiritually simply through neglect. So when we take a look at this, what's, what's happening is these people are basing themselves, I am my own God. We become our own deity at that point in time. I know better than God. I can do all these things myself. Self-governance, self-reliance. I don't need a God. I got me. And I can do it all. I can do it all. If there is no Godhead figure, no morals, no absolute truth, then there's no basis for right and wrong. Think about that. What happens next? No right or wrong. Then anything's free and open to be done, right? There's no morals. There's no basis for right and wrong. There's no absolute truth. The word of God is irrelevant. It doesn't stand anymore. So what happens in society? We see a moral decay. And we see that prevalent in our society today. We're here now, folks. This is where we are. This is real life. So when we talk about in real life, we're here. It's here. It's now. We're living through it. People tend to want to become their own God in the process. In my disciple uh, Bible study, guys, it says this. Self-love and materialism head the list of sins leading to depravity. Religious practices can be part of these depraved people's lives, but the power of God plays no part in directing their lives. The depraved person learns much, but never puts learning into practice. And never give us reverence to the source of truth. Such people cannot be counted as believers. They have a loss of morals and ethics because those would be standing in the way of their carnal pleasures. Now, this was a forewarning that was written a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago. They saw this prevalent in society back then. They saw the trend for where they're moving to. This utopian idealism and replacing God with self. It's kind of frightening. It really is because we're here today. They were right. Those of us who are believers, see, we've got those Christian ethics. We've got moral imperatives. And those are guidelines to help us understand that certain attitudes and actions, lifestyles, self-identification are wrong and always will be 
Paul provide us that long list in his letter to Timothy that we just read. The bad life centers on self and sensuality, not on God and others. The word of God tells us that we are here to serve God and to serve others. But the word of society today is you're here to serve yourself and there is no God. God is dead. Evil people manipulate and abuse the needy and weak instead of helping them in today's society. God's people must be continually studying the inspired word of God to understand what the truth is. The truth is the word of God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It tells us that right in the word. We need to let that correct us and change us from what the behavior of the world is and what it's trying to do with us. And I'm not trying to be a doomsday purveyor of fear here today. I'm just trying to give a good view of what reality in life, in real life, is today. Good news, all is not lost. God is not dead, nor is he even close to it. God is alive and well and ready, and here's the very important part. He's ready to help if we invite him in. See, that's the most important part is we have to accept God. We have to accept Christ into our lives. We have to invite him into our lives to guide and direct our hearts and our minds and Guide us on our path, our journey through life. So let's look at some of the real life examples that I have for you here today. Terry alluded to this <laughs> this morning. On Monday, January 2nd, 2023, on Monday Night Football, just nine minutes into the game between the Cincinnati Bengals and the Buffalo Bills, the Cincinnati Bengals wide receiver T. Higgins rammed into Damar Hamlin at full speed hitting him in the chest area after catching a 13-yard pass from Joe Burrow. Now, those of you who weren't there, I'm just trying to help fill in the blanks, give you that mental picture of what's going on. 24-year-old Handelman stood up, appeared to adjust his helmet, took two steps, and then keeled over backwards. His body was limp, and he was in full cardiac arrest. It was a horrifying moment for everyone that was tuned into that game because we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know. So that's that immediate fear. Hamlet would be down for more than 18 minutes while receiving medical attention on the field, both CPR and automatic external defibrillator, an AED was used as well. His heart stopped twice and they restarted. And those were all administered before the ambulance arrived to take him to the hospital. But see, that's, that's the fear part. That's the unknowing part. And see, if God was dead, it would just end there and he would go to the hospital and the end of the story. But see, God's not dead. God's not dead. What happened next was what exactly I said. God is alive and well and ready if we invite him in. So what happened next? This is the really cool part. What happened next was truly amazing. Those throughout the nation who were watching the game stopped what they were doing and prayed. They were inviting God into the situation. They were inviting God in to take over and do what man could not do. They were inviting God in to be the solution. It wasn't just them. The players, both teams, prayed. Sportscasters prayed. And they went further and they said, anybody watching, please pray for him. Pray over the next. And over the next week, thousands joined in prayer for a speedy recovery and a restoration of health for Hamlet. What's wrong with this picture? God's dead. He's irrelevant. He doesn't matter. And yet, thousands and thousands of people pray to God to save him. Because God's not dead. Nor is he irrelevant. 
nor is it useless. It showed that even though God may not be prevalent in their lives, they still believed enough and knew enough that God was necessary to the safety and well-being of Damar Hamlin. See, that, that part of them that learned that at an early age came back to say, God's necessary here. We need God here. See, God was still alive inside them people. He just needed to be woke up. He needed to be invited in. Now, nine short days later, he was released from the hospital. Nothing short of miraculous. God's not dead. Surely, he's alive. In our movie this month, God's Not Dead 4, we saw several examples of God at work. Aisha got in a bad car accident. She got hit by a truck, sent to the hospital, and she was in bad shape. But what happened to that is, in the movie before, God's Not Dead 3, she accepted Christ into her life. The problem was, her family came from Iran. They were Muslim. And when she did that, according to Sharia law, her father had the right to kill her. But what he did was, he said, you're dead to me. And he kicked her out of the house. He barred her from the family. He wouldn't return any of her phone calls. He wouldn't have any contact with her. Because of, he was of the Muslim faith. She was no longer abiding to the tenets of, of Islam. He was required by his faith to disavow his daughter. So she became dead to him. He cut all ties with her. That was until the hospital called and said that his daughter was in bad shape. His fatherly love was still there. So he goes to her in the hospital. But more than that, he prays to God and pleads for God to hear. And he was daughter. He even offered to take her place. He even offered to take her place. There's Kleenexes back there for you. <laughs> See, and the thing about it is, is that went completely against his faith basis. But he still went to God. He went into that chapel and he stared at the cross. He said, I'll take her place. Can you hear me? Now, if God was dead, that fell on deaf ears. But what happened next was truly a blessing. See, he waits to hear from God in that chapel. And he does. Almost immediately. <clears throat> came in the form of a little boy, Jackson, who was struggling with his own issues. God used both of them to heal each other. And in the process, they were both blessed. In the midst of the crisis, God was there and he saw them through it. That's what God does when he works in real life. When we invite him into our lives to be the solution. To be the solution. God did what they could not. He gave them the healing and the restoration that they needed. They healed each other in the process. He gave them a new purpose and he gave them a fresh start. God is good. All, All the time. time. All the time. God is, good. God is good. We see another example of God at work in a healing done of a broken life with Taylor, who happens to be Jackson's mother. See, when her husband died serving, she lost everything. She lost the love of her life. She lost her purpose. She lost her identity. She lost her career. She lost everything. So what happened? She was just kind of going through the motions. 
She was simply doing life and nothing more. She took on a menial job just to pay the bills, a, a means to an end, surviving day to day. And each day she watched as her son withdrew into himself further and further. And the teachers in school were saying, he needs some help. He needs help. So what happened? Well, the school board threatened the homeschoolers. Threats from the educational system. What they thought was going to crush the people, energize the people. See, in that process, Taylor, she found her purpose. She got her purpose back. She had something to fight for. It was her son. It was her freedoms, the freedoms that her husband paid the price for, the ultimate price. He died for those freedoms. So she found a purpose in life. Her faith was in God, and that brought her through. But even more, she came out better than what she was before. She found that restoration. She found that healing. She found grace in real life. God restored her in the process of doing work for other people. She was testifying before Congress. And they found out that she wasn't some little lady that knew nothing. She was an engineer at NASA before her husband passed away. She had an absolutely incredible career doing important work in real life. See, that whole movie was based on real life events. God is working. He's not dead. He's surely alive. And working. We gotta invite him in to do the work. We have to bring him in as the most important foundational point in our lives. I can give you a very good example of God's grace in action. So two weeks ago I was struggling heavily health-wise with, uh, well you probably remember, <laughs> with uh, asthmatic bronchitis and an acute sinus infection. And I could hardly speak a complete sentence. And I was having a hard time talking to Terry before the service. So I came to the church that morning not knowing if I'd be able to give my message or not. And Lori even offered to give my message and come up and read my message if I couldn't speak. I got a great wife. But see, God had put it on my heart to trust him. And to know that he's going to get trouble. <clears throat> Sorry. See, it's really what I needed to see. That God was in control of my life. He got me through the entire message. 2,807 words. I went back to the <laughs> well, You always add to that. So right? You know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Most likely birth. <laughs> See, and I did that whole message with barely any issue whatsoever. And that was unheard of just an hour before. See, God's not dead in real life. In real life. And Terry said, we, we've been here now doing our services for five years. In that time, I can't tell you how many answered prayers we've had here at Grace Street Church. But see, all of those answered prayers, they're real. They are real. They're not just mere coincidence. And I feel that that for certain is a sign of God in action in this church, in this body of believers. Because we've seen it over and over again. I think we can plainly see from the message today and the works of God's hands throughout the world today that God is not dead, nor is he irrelevant, nor is he unwanted in today's world. God is a necessary part 
of life. We truly cannot do life absent of God. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for this blessing that you gave us today, <laughs> for your words, for your words and music. I hope everyone who hears both in person and online today can listen to the message that you have in the music that you'll help me choose. And I thank you, Lord, that you are here with us to lead us and guide us through our earthly walk. Thank you that you open up doors of opportunity for us when others slam shut. Or at times when we feel we've reached dead ends in our lives, we thank you that you give us a new opportunity. You give us a new beginning. You give us resolution to the things that we face in our life. And we pray that you would be with us as we seek to adjust to the world around us. That you are standing with us each and every step of the way. I pray, Lord, that this is not only a new and a fresh beginning here today for us, but a fresh start where you become central and an increasingly important part of all we do, every bit of our lives. Knowing that in of ourselves, we can do nothing, but through you, through Christ, we can do all things through Christ who straightens us. Lord Jesus, emboldening us to let go of our past. Give us the courage to step out into the unknown, into our future, holding tightly to your hand. Lord, thank you for letting us know that you have scheduled every step of our lives and have promised to guide us on every step as we look to Jesus, as we give our lives to you, as we invite you in, the author and the purveyor of our faith. So in your hand, we place today this new beginning. And we thank you that in your strength, this might be a fresh start that begins and continues with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is all in real life. Neither Mark nor I had heard that, or IRL, as it's put on social media. We hadn't heard that until Matthew. Uh, we first met Matthew in real life, and so it, it's kind of a, kind of stuck in our brains. And as I as I come up here and, and as I think about what the Lord's Supper is, this happened in real life. For, and this is how. Paul uh, writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And a little later in this Passover meal, Jesus took the cup. And in the same way, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We see this over and over again. It's not just, and Mark mentioned, we have seen so many answered prayers. We've seen so many, we've had so many praises over the years. It's five years as a church and, and six as a ministry because we started Bible studying the year before that. And we saw countless answered prayers over and over and over again. Some of those prayers are not necessarily the way that we would have wanted them, but they were working that God saw fit for them to be. 
and we will continue to see people healed. We will continue, and I'm, and I'm not just talking about from sickness, we'll see families healed. We'll see marriages healed. When we go to God and we remember exactly what he did for us by sending his son to die for us. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Father, you have done so much for us. From before the beginning of time, you knew us. Before we were born, before we were formed in our mother's womb, you knew us. You had a plan for our lives. You have given us the opportunity to reach your people, your lost sheep, your lost coin, or, or your prodigal sons and daughters. Father, as Mark said, thousands, even millions, went to prayer on that Monday night. It was a night where most thought they were going to a football game and ended up in a prayer meeting. Father, let our lives be a constant prayer meeting, a constant reminder of what you did for us by sending your son to die on the cross for us so that each and every day in real life we can meet you just as the Muslim father met that small child. And that small child met that father. Let us come together as a people, Father, sharpening each other as iron sharpens iron. Let us grow together, Father. And regardless of what the world throws at us, we know that in the end, we'll be with you. In Jesus' name. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everyone this morning. Oh my goodness, it's wonderful to have everybody here. And what a great sermon! I have to thank you so much, both of you, for that sermon, because this morning I was asking God what to pray about and what my verse was going to be. And I didn't know anything about this, what you were saying this morning, but my verse is exactly the call to worship this morning. I, I am just amazed. I'm always in awe of what God has planned. It's just a miracle in my mind every day. God is good. God is good. All the time. Yes, God is good. So um, this morning, I'd just like to do a blanket prayer for everyone who is in need. And if there's some people that would like their names, you know, spread out there, let me know. I've got most everybody in here, but if there's some more people that need prayer, is anybody, anybody else? Well, then we'll get started. So, I started with Isaiah 40, 28, 29. I guess we must need to hear it again. <laughs> the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Father God, we come to you this morning to honor and praise you above all things. You are the great physician, the Prince of Peace, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the great I Am. We praise you above all names. You are the Trinity, Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, you sent us your son Jesus to live among us, to die on the cross only to be raised from the dead three days later, so that by his name, Jesus, all who call on his name might be saved. Therefore, today, by your name, Jesus, we humbly ask for healing for the following people, Diane, Steve, Jace, Harold, Larry, Mary, Don, Carla, Colleen, John, and Jen, and all those online who would like prayer. 
We thank you that we can come to you with all the details of our sufferings. And we can trust you for all these things, Lord. I know sometimes we don't know what to pray for. In times of devastation and suffering and pain, we just need to say and call on your name, Jesus. 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 And you are there for us. In the midst of our pain and our sorrow, you alone will guide us through it. Each one of these people has specific needs that you already know about, Lord. Please comfort and heal their minds and hearts and their bodies according to your will, Lord Jesus. We thank you, God, for each one of them. Help them to seek you daily, for you alone will walk and talk with them through it all. There's a song that's been in my head all week by Andrew Riff. It's called Fill My Cup. And it says, Fill my cup, Lord. Run it over. I am a child in need. Fill my house with hope. Fill my plans up with purpose. Fill my words up with healing, or my wounds up with healing. Lord, I need you to fill my cup. I am a child in need. As all of us are, Lord, we thank you for all things. And Lord, we ask for safe travel mercies for Mark as he goes back on the road for work. Ride with him, Lord, wherever he travels and keep him safe at all times. Bring him back to us safely. Also, Lord, be with Lori and comfort her heart while Mark is gone. Send her help for any need that she has in his absence. Walk closely with her during these times. For all of us who walk with you daily, never walk alone. We thank you and praise you for all the mercy and grace you bestow on each one of us each day. For carrying, carrying us through the darkest and hardest times in our lives. For you are always with us. You never leave us alone. If we read your word, look to you for all things. We thank you, Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. want to say that you know as we gather together on Sundays here as, as our family of believers the church is a body of believers that comes together and as family we never walk alone God is with us but we're all with each other we're all there for each other as we go through hard times as we go through joys as we share our times together we have the ability to bless others. And in so doing, we get blessed. And so I just want to thank everyone for all of the prayers, for being a family together, and to be bringing God to others who may have lost as well. So as we close out our online portion of our service today, uh, please accept this blessing our closing prayer gracious heavenly father thank you that you make all things new thank you for the victory and power in your name thank you that you hold the keys over death and that by your might jesus was raised from the grave paving that way for us to have a new life with you thank you that you have a plan for us and that you made a way for us to join you in eternity and we confess today our need for you. Refresh us today. Make us new again. We ask that you would renew our hearts and our minds and our lives for the days ahead. And we pray for your redemption for us. Keep your words of truth planted firm within us and help us keep focused on what is pure and right and give us the power to be obedient to your word. And when the enemy reminds us where we've been, send his, his lies and attacks our way, we trust that your voice speaks louder and stronger, reminding us that we are safe with you and that your purposes and plans for us will not fail. We ask that you would be our defense and our guard. 
keeping our way clear and removing the obstacles and covering the pitfalls that lay before us. Lord, lead us on to your level ground. Shine your light in us, through us and over us, to be a light to our world in these dark times. Help us make a difference in this world for your glory and for your purposes. Set your way before us, and may all your plans succeed. May we reflect your peace and hope to a world that so desperately needs your presence, your healing, and thanks be to you, God, for your indescribable gift of your Son, Jesus. To you be glory and honor this day and forevermore. In Jesus' name.